take particular pleasure in introducing my colleague Jim Barrett, professor of history and the Watts professorial scholar at the University of Illinois, on the occasion of his talk for the immigration series sponsored by the Center for Advanced Study today. Professor Barrett is an internationally known historian of US and comparative labor, whose work over this quarter, past quarter century of a career has advanced not just class as a category of analysis, but the experiences of working people at every turn. His books, critical editions, essays, and journal articles range across the immigrant experience, but have been vitally centered on the city of Chicago, which emerges as a global space of ideas and practices for working class community in his research and teaching equally. Jim's commitment to putting the history of labor at the heart of narratives that aim to capture the social meanings and residues of the past has marked all of his work as a scholar and represents now a hugely impressive and well-regarded body of work. Best known for his histories of radical politics, he has always lodged immigrant communities at the heart of his histories of working class America. For many years now, this has entailed a comparative look at Irish and Italians, Poles and African Americans in the urban crucible of Chicago's neighborhoods and has often involved collaborative research with colleague David Rodiger and teaching with colleagues Diane Conker and Augusto Espiritu. He has been the recipient of numerous awards and prizes from local, regional, and national bodies, including the NEH, the Newberry Library, and the Illinois Federation of Teachers. For all his prodigious and influential research, it is in the classroom that Jim is in many ways as distinguished. He has been a stalwart and deeply loved undergraduate teacher. His course on the history of Illinois is always filled to capacity, and he rarely misses recognition annually as one of Illinois' most excellent teachers. As impressive as the number of dissertations he has supervised and graduate students he has mentored and helped into teaching and research careers all over the country and indeed the world. Wherever I go in the profession, I am greeted by scholars who know Jim's work, students who have benefited from his counsel, and colleagues who admire his civic engagement. Jim is a great part of what history of Illinois is, someone whose work models who we aspire to be as historians, public and teachers. It's fitting that Jim should be joined today by another distinguished historian, our colleague David Rodiger, who's Babcock Professor of History here and the author in his own right of many important and influential books, which I know that you're all familiar with. If the Irish are indeed everywhere, as the title of today's talk suggests, the scholarly work of, of Jim and Dave both, separately and together, are responsible for the nuanced understandings we have, not just of the Irish, but of their immigration experience and its world historical significance. Most famous, perhaps, is their joint essay, In Between Peoples, Race, Nationality, and the New Immigrant Working Class from the Journal of American Ethnic History in 1997. Now, if I were Jim, I might say something smart-alecky here, <laughs> like, Irish, Irish everywhere and not a drop to drink. <laughs> Instead, I will say, and in all seriousness, he is a great historian, a great colleague, and a scholar citizen par excellence. Please join me in welcoming Jim Barrett. Okay. Um, I think this microphone is on okay. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to do a few very quick thank yous. Uh, the first one is to uh, Antoinette for the very nice, slightly embarrassing introduction. And uh, I wanted to thank Gail, um, who spoke a minute ago. Uh, it was really Gail's idea uh, to launch this initiative, and she was kind enough to invite me to join her on it. Um, the Center for Advanced Study has facilitated all of this, and don't blame them for not enough seats. We actually tried to fix this problem, and we're not able to do it. Uh, the people at the Center for Advanced Study, uh, who I wanted to mention, are especially uh, Masumi Urie and Liesl Wildhagen. Uh, I also wanted, I'll do it very briefly, but I wanted to thank uh, Dave Rodiger. Uh, Antoinette has done some of the lifting on this already, but the fact is that um, uh, people who know what I've been doing will recognize that uh, uh, Dave's work has not only been a great inspiration, but really at every turn a lot of the ideas are ideas that I really uh, share with him, and it was very good of him to take the time to comment today. To put on my reading glasses. Um, what I'm going to do is talk a bit uh, at the beginning in kind of shorthand form about uh, Irish American culture. 
and uh, then talk a little bit about uh, its influence with other peoples and contacts between the Irish and other peoples, and bit about this process that I call Americanization from the bottom up, sort of the acculturation of immigrant uh, peoples in sort of everyday settings, and then finish up with just a, a very brief effort to try to actually explain some of this. This is Henry Golden recalling his life on the Lower East Side. Though surrounded by Poles and Italians, it was the Irish and the Irish alone we Jews admired. We identified the Irishmen not only with the English language, but also with the image of what an American looked like. The Irish were the cops and the firemen and the ball players, the figures we Jewish immigrants wanted to emulate. I saw Orthodox Jewish women literally jump for joy at the birth of a grandson and say, he looks just like an Irishman. <laughs> However much they might have liked to, the new immigrants arriving uh, in the United States around the turn of the century found it very difficult to avoid the Irish. More than three million Irish immigrants entered the United States between 1840 and 1890. And by the time an estimated five million first and second generation Irish had settled uh, by the turn of the century, the sources of immigration had shifted with 18 million so-called new immigrants arriving largely from Eastern and Southeastern Europe between 1890 and 1920. Migrant peoples certainly encountered a range of ethnic groups and the greatest influences for their own acculturation likely de derived from their own communities. But whether they wanted to save their souls, get a drink, or find a job, the newcomers often had to make their way in an urban world that must have seemed uh, to be dominated by the Irish. The searing experience of the um, famine uh, in Ireland uh, is something that held on in, in Irish communities a, long, a lot longer, I think, than we realize because of the oral tradition, strong oral tradition. And I think it's in part um, that experience of the famine that shaped a culture that mixed aggressiveness and defensiveness, a strong sense of grievance and sensitivity to any slight, with a strong ambition to make a place for the Irish in the New World. Their reception in the American city also helps to explain this defensive quality of Irish American culture. They were excluded from much of uh, the city's public life, jobs, uh, their neighborhoods, uh, and churches attacked. Mid 19th century commentators began referring to what they called a Celtic mind and something they termed Irishism. That is, quote, an alleged condition of degradation and depravity habitual to immigrants and maybe even their children. Arriving with few skills and resources, the Irish competed for low jobs with African Americans throughout the mid-19th century, often organizing to drive blacks from these jobs. Early confrontations and later ones with African American strike breakers enhanced the racism of Irish Americans and their presence and uh, their persistence in pursuing an identity as white workers. Their strategies seemed to leave them in all the important locations by the time the newcomers were arriving. Coming with facility in English and a strong parish-based network of organizations and political connections, the Irish turned their cultural proclivities to their distinct advantage in unions, the Democratic Party, and the Catholic Church. In a single generation, the Irish went from the most rural people in Western Europe to the most urbanized in North America, 90% living in cities by 1920. Long after arriving, most remained scattered throughout the city. Um, I'm going to put an image up here. Uh, I could do a similar one for Chicago. This one's for Manhattan Island. And uh, it shows the distribution of, uh, it does it by, in this case, by uh, parishes. Shows the distribution of uh, the Irish across the island from Washington Heights down to the Battery. Um, the 1880 census estimated that nearly two million people of Irish heritage lived in the city's uh, boroughs. And yet only two of Manhattan's wards, Tribeca and the Battery, had small Irish majorities. Elsewhere in New York and in other cities, the Irish lived amidst a welter of other ethnic groups. The newcomers encountering Irish policemen, Irish politicians, Irish bureaucrats, Irish saloon keepers, Irish contractors, and Irish teachers could be excused for thinking that Irish equaled American. 
the Irish played a significant role in the newcomers' Americanization, with the result that the new multi-ethnic urban culture that emerged by the Great Depression years often assumed a peculiarly Hiber Hibernian cast. Their rise by the end of the 19th century positioned the more established Irish to play a dual role as guides to the ways of America and as gatekeepers who were afforded the opportunity to harass and humiliate and to sharpen the lines between the hyphenated American and the greenhorn. Yet a view which sees the Irish simply as an impediment to those who followed after them greatly distorts their role. They also help to make a place for newer immigrants in American society amidst the extreme nativism from the late 19th century uh, through the intolerant sort of social terrain of the 1920s. The Irish used their institutions uh, to some extent to shelter immigrants and at the very least it provided an entree for new immigrants uh, arriving in these cities uh, in the later generations. Although upward mobility was relatively low in the first generation, some second generation Irish Americans had risen by the early 20th century. The Irish hod carrier in the second generation has become a bricklayer, Jacob Rees wrote, if not the alderman of his ward. But many Irish Americans had not risen. Late 19th century observers noted a residuum who remained working in unskilled jobs, mixing with the new immigrants from Italy, Russia, and Eastern Europe. The result is a sediment, Reese wrote with apparent distaste, the product of more than a generation in the city's slums. By the early 20th century, then, a measure of insecurity and grievance remained. Even the lace curtain Irish families remained, quote, remarkably estranged from the dominant culture of their adopted country, wondering whether full assimilation was possible or even desirable. Deeply devoted and rooted to a religious tradition despised by many middle class Protestants, even the bourgeois Irish occasionally felt the sting of, of uh, prejudice. Their poorer brethren often decided they could compete best for jobs, housing, and influence by banding together and simply locking the newcomers out. Periodic bursts of nativism and anti-Catholicism and the persistent specter of poverty haunted this rising middle class who became, quote, morbidly sensitive to any perceived threat to their tenuous grasp on respectability. We are only halfway up the ladder, an Irish Catholic teacher wrote in the 1920s. This perceived vulnerability helps to explain a defensive mentality in the streets and workplaces, in churches and political organizations, and even on the vaudeville stage. Conflicts with later immigrant and migrant people of color are explained by Irish efforts to retain what status and resources they had garnered by the end of the 19th century. Their numbers, the timing of their arrival, the hostile reception they faced, and their efforts to build their own institutions in the face of continuing bigotry meant that Irish Catholics constituted what one scholar has called the first ethnic group in the United States. And what I want to do now is turn to this question of sort of voices in Irish America, uh, making the point, uh, I hope, that uh, we're talking about a lot of different kinds of people. <laughs> Generalized view uh, about the, um, the Irish Americans, uh, I wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, there's a lot of variety here, and what we can do is suggest some of it. So if the Irish community spoke then to the later uh, migrant peoples, uh, they never spoke with one voice. And you had not just the usual divisions that you have in immigrant communities between the old world first generation and the American kids, but you also had a very sharp uh, class division. There's not enough work done on it really, uh, between the so-called lace curtain Irish and the shanty Irish. Uh, this is a very strong theme in Irish American uh, literature. And the Irish, uh, like the people that came after them, uh, came at first with local identities. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, the, the networks that they had were sort of local kinship networks from villages uh, in Ireland. But pretty quickly, um, they extended these networks in cities like uh, New York City uh, and Chicago. So in New York, uh, the people were very quickly connected, is the word that would be used in the uh, community in New York City. And in Chicago, they soon had some clout. 
Should your brother Patty come to America at turn of the century and wrote home, he can rely on his cousins to promote his interests in procuring work. In New York, care disproportionately among paper handlers, people from Donegal in construction and tunnel work, those from Clare on the Lower West Side docks. Police and fire departments became Irish preserves. Irish domestics provided leads for newcomers on the best homes to serve as a maid or a cook. The county societies persisted through the early 20th century, not only because of their famous dances, uh, but also because they were excellent places to find jobs. What went without saying was that where Irish Americans were in a position to hire or at least put in a good word, others were at a disadvantage. <coughs> through nationalist agitation, nativist attacks, political self-interest, most Irish by the early 20th century saw themselves as, by that label, not as these, these more local sort of identities. And yet, the mass Irish nationalist movement, which reached its height in the World War I era, uh, still represented this sort of diversity of perspectives, so that, for example, physical force activists uh, continued to vie with constitutionalists for leadership of the movement. Black nationalists, recognized the significance of the Irish struggle in the broader campaign against imperialism. When Marcus Garvey saluted Eamon de Valera and hailed the establishment of a new Irish Republic at the 1920 Universal Negro Improvement Association Conference, 20,000 delegates roared their approval. Black radicals Claude McKay and Cyril Briggs, who called the Irish independence struggle, quote, the greatest epic of modern history, maintained contacts with the Irish radicals a development closely monitored by government spies. Briggs modeled his African blood brotherhood on the Irish Republican Brotherhood, while Garvey named Harlem's Liberty Hall after the Dublin headquarters of James Connolly's socialist wing of the Irish movement. Irish American nationalism had become the standard, Matthew Guterl concludes, by which all, of, all other subversive nationalisms were to be judged. Linked to the insurgent African-American radicalism of the 20s and drawing on the higher living standards and psychic energy of the, in the course of the Great Migration, the cultural explosion that came to be known as the Harlem Renaissance found some of its inspiration in the 1890s, Douglas Hyde's Gaelic League invented a revolutionary, de-anglicized Celtic culture rooted in Irish folk traditions and language. For many African-American uh, writers, this was an inspiration. Uh, there's pretty good evidence that there were contacts between Sorry. No, no, it's okay. But it's very hard to believe that with my voice, people would not be able to hear me with this. Uh, <laughs> there's never any complaints that I'm speaking too softly. Um, so the point is that there's a lot of contacts between these uh, uh, African-American writers. And for the moment, I'm talking about Irish rather than Irish-American uh, uh, writers. But uh, the, the uh, Gaelic Renaissance, what's called the Gaelic Renaissance, had a big influence in Irish communities as well. Um, so the two movements shared many of the aesthetic characteristics of nationalist art, appeals to a forgotten and noble past, themes based on the experience of common people, and a language based on their dialects. Nationalism usually conquers in the name of a putative folk culture, Ernest Gellner has written. Its symbolism is drawn from the healthy, pristine, vigorous life of the peasants. Both movements carried considerable political freight, and both drew the uh, critical uh, gaze of a rising middle class in each case whose interest in nationalism was more cultural than political. Not surprisingly, Given the deep ambivalence in the Irish American community over issues of race, new Negroes remained wary of the Irish. I shall at all times defend the right of Ireland to absolute independence, the boys wrote to a friend in 1921, but there can be no doubt of the hostility of a large portion of Irish Americans towards Negroes. Cyril Briggs, who remained committed to cooperation between African American and white radicals, nevertheless included the Irish in what he called, quote, the charmed circle of the dominant race. I want to talk for a few minutes now about what I mean by Irish Americanism. And I'm actually going to skip a couple of the topics that I have on the outline there. I'm just going to sort of gesture to them. But
skin in what I'm quite sure is the um, right spot and one that's not talked about uh, a lot of times uh, at, uh, uh, in our sort of secular culture. And that is a very uh, uh, peculiarly intense and institutional form of uh, Irish Catholicism. As in other dimensions of Irish American life, this form of religion enhanced the parochial character of the urban ethnic community, but it also provided a bridge of sorts to other Catholic uh, migrant peoples as they entered in the wake of the Irish. Both a resource and a focal point for their identity, Irish control of the church brought frequent contact and tensions with a range of other ethnic groups. Boston's population became increasingly diverse with every census after 1880, and yet 80% of its priests were still first or second genera generation Irish through the early 20th century. The Irish controlled virtual, virtually every important diocese, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Baltimore, and others. By 1920, two-thirds of all Catholic bishops were of Irish birth or descent. The Irish had not only organized most of the early parishes and church institutions, their sons and daughters poured into the religious orders out of all proportion to their uh, numbers in the population. Uh, in the United States, orders that were founded as German or French orders by the early 20th century were primarily Irish as a result of this sort of constant uh, flow of either immigrant or native born. Particularly after World War I, with increasing centralization and the emergence of a standard diocesan curriculum, even children in ethnic national parishes bore the mark of the church's Irish-American hierarchy and intelligentsia. As immigrant families moved into more ethnically mixed neighborhoods from the 1920s on, they sometimes found themselves in Irish-dominated parish schools that conferred what they called an implicit Irish mentality. Uh, in this sense, incidentally, um, Irish-American nuns played a sort of neglected role in this process of Irish-Americanization. Um, this is not private property. This is a city street in Chicago, out in front of the named uh, parish, which is where my family started out on the west side of Chicago. And you can see that um, the Irish had these ways of sort of marking uh, the streets. There's actually a uh, ritual, uh, it's out of fashion now, but there was a ritual in Catholic society that was called walking the boundaries of the parish and the priest would actually get out there with a, a cross and uh, there'd be a sort of long procession of people. So when I talk about the territorial character of Irish Catholicism and its, its impact in the city, uh, I think this was a very real thing and it was a very, part of the, a very important part of the culture of these people. And the spatial and spiritual and social character of the Catholic parish formed the center of these Irish American communities. As they went about the city, these uh, young people from other ethnic and racial groups um, acquired kind of imaginary maps that they carried around uh, in their uh, heads. Um, this is partly from personal experience I'm speaking, but I mean there's pretty good evidence that uh, this is the way uh, young people thought the city is kind of sort of clearly demarcated kind of zones. Among the University of Chicago sociologists uh, wrote, fighting has been described as a sort of national habit. A vehicle for conflict with other ra uh, racial and ethnic groups, gang also became a model and a vehicle for the organization of rivals in the city. Far more than we realize an author wrote in 1912, the boys gang out the public school the great problem of assimilating the diverse race States. The problem, of course, was that acculturation and these notions of territorial came white racism, anti Semitism, other forms of prejudice. On the streets of American cities, then, this too was Americanization. But if the Irish dominated the church and gave it much of its territorial quality, they also passed on a progressive tradition. I won't go into detail here, but I'd be glad to talk about it afterwards. There's a very interesting uh, pastoral letter from the bishops of the United States in 1919, which if you take a look at it, lays out the sort of a blueprint for the New Deal and kind of more generally for a welfare state uh, in the United States, all the way from public housing through social insurance, the right to organize and strike and so forth. Um, what's very interesting about this, and I think it's, it's, it's the, if I've got a theme here, it's this kind of two sides of Irish American culture, uh, is that the same bishop's letter uh, contained the most restrictive language up to that point 
with regard to birth control and sexuality. So these are sort of two different dimensions. If you want to know what the Irish American bishops are pa passing on uh, to the later people, this is part of it. Recall that their main target, though, uh, Margaret Sanger, uh, was clearly uh, really steeped in uh, Irish American uh, culture. She's from, from an Irish uh, uh, working class uh, family. And there were um, more radical Irish that uh, sort of remained within the church. Uh, there's uh, many of the members of the Communist Party in Ireland, for example, remained Catholics. Exactly how you do that, I'm not sure, but that's the way it worked there. And then there were other people like Margaret Sanger, and another one is Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, who clearly broke with the church because they not only developed a radical politics, they also developed a radical lifestyle to, to uh, go along with it. I'm going to um, just sort of pass over uh, the whole problem of the um, urban machine. Uh, but there's not too many things I like to talk about more than that, so I'd be glad to come back to that. Uh, I think the main point to be made here uh, on sort of the uh, empirical side is that um, the Irish dominated uh, urban politics uh, in not just in New York and Chicago, but in one city after another. And they dominated this politics after they had become a small minority. In other words, what I'm saying is that the strongest machines developed in the wake of this massive uh, in-migration of uh, uh, European uh, peoples and then later African Americans uh, and uh, Mexican Americans. And therein lies another one of these stories about the Irish doing a certain amount of sort of what I'll call in a minute bridging uh, and integrating uh, as well as uh, excluding uh, from patronage jobs, from slates and so forth. And they uh, lesson here, if there is one, uh, in terms of urban politics is where the Irish accommodated, uh, where they integrated younger politicians from other ethnic and racial groups, and this is clearly what they did in Chicago over a period of time. They didn't have much choice. They were a much smaller minority and there was a much more diverse population. Where they did that, and there are other cities that they did it, they persisted. The machine actually did not go away. It uh, persisted quite a while, I would say, certainly through the Depression years and, of course, in Chicago, some would say down to the present day. And where they didn't, and Tammany Hall is a good case where the Irish tried to hold on and would not slate uh, uh, newcomers and would not share patronage jobs, they perished. Uh, it, it, uh, once the newer immigrant groups became better organized politically and became a little bit more aggressive, uh, machines like uh, Tammany Hall could, uh, could no longer exist. I want to talk for just a couple of minutes about um, the class side of this. Uh, Antoinette is, uh, for good or ill, is not wrong about my argument about social class in American history. I, I think that uh, uh, very often we, we, we really don't pay enough attention to this, and I think it's a very important issue. I think in the case of the Irish, it's a little bit misunderstood. And one of the reasons is that um, they loom very large in the labor movement. So, for example, um, I think the figure for Boston, uh, this is uh, in the early years of the 20th century, maybe as late as 1920, was that about 90% of the elected union positions were controlled uh, by the Irish. Even at the sort of national level for the American Federation of Labor, which is in a lot of different ways their organization. They, they really put their mark on the American Federation of Labor. And they control, uh, it, I would say, at least 55% of the um, national presidencies. The only group that's very close is uh, Russian and East European Jews. Uh, particularly in the uh, garment industry, but also in some other industries. So what we get there, in other words, what's the lesson there and what's the uh, uh, interaction with the new uh, immigrant workers? These people are primarily business unionists. Uh, their model is to uh, organize skilled workers, experienced workers, uh, male workers kind of by definition. Um, uh, very little effort on the part of most of these people to organize. Uh, the new immigrants when they come in, a lot of nativism. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, quote here from an Irish organizer in uh, um, New York City, actually the head AFL organizer in New York City. They ask him about, you know, maybe it'd be a good idea to sort of translate these leaflets that you're passing out into some of these other languages. And his reaction was, let them learn English. Uh, so you have this very closed quality to a lot of these business uh, union organizations that they organize. The problem is that there's another tradition, and it's not one or two people. It's a, it's a fairly substantial sort of tradition, which is a much more progressive uh, labor tradition. And I just want to introduce you to two 
uh, characters that sort of fit in uh, uh, under this rubric. The first one is uh, someone who, um, uh, one of our graduate students, uh, uh, PhD student that Dave and I share ha has introduced people to. And this is Leonora O'Reilly. Her, her dates are up here, 1870 to 1927. And for a new generation of Irish American women organizers, she seemed to fuse a lot of the influences that were kind of characteristic among this group. Nora went to work in a shirt factory at the age of 11. Like her contemporary Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, she emerged as a spellbinding soapbox orator. Uh, this is first on the streets of Harlem and then later in uh, uh, Lower East Side and other places. She joined the Knights of Labor as a teenager. She became the first organizer for the United Gar Garment Workers Union. She helped to launch the Women's Trade Union League in 1903. And she later worked closely with immigrant Jewish activists in uh, the great uh, garment worker strike of 1909. O'Reilly helped to bring New York's Women's Trade Union League um, out of the tea room and into the streets and factories of New York. But her experiences underscore the class <laughs> that lay at the heart of uh, the League's class coalition. And we're talking about contacts between Irish Americans and other groups. In this case, now I'm talking about contacts between working class Irish women on the one hand and uh, middle class uh, uh, um, largely Protestant reformers on the other hand. She suffered from what she called, called quote, an overdose of allies, some of whom she found very condescending. Like other Irish American suffrage activists, and it turns out there were a lot of these people, the generalization in the literature, the historians will be bored by this part, but just so that people know, the generalization in the literature is that the great bulwark against suffrage for women was the Irish Catholic community. And there's a lot actually to that. The church, for example, was uh, uh, largely in opposition to the change. Actually, there's a lot of Irish American uh, suffragettes. We, they would and this is a, a connection between the sort of heart, the middle class heart, let's say for the moment, of the, this particular reform movement on the one hand and the great mass of working women on the other hand, the Irish American women played an important role there. They also, incidentally, without going into it, played an important role in the nationalist movement, both in Ireland and in the United States, uh, and in various other uh, social movements. And as I said earlier, some of these sort of fused, kind of traditional Catholic values, Nora uh, O'Reilly, for example, never married, uh, uh, lived with uh, her mother all of her life, uh, and took care of her mother in her old age and, and, and in illness. Uh, so she had this kind of radical lifestyle on the one hand, but still held to, you know, I would say very traditional sort of Irish Catholic values on the other. In the years um, up to and uh, 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 through World War I, um, she helped to organize progressive uh, nationalist organizations. And while she left the Women's Trade Union League, she, became, uh, she remained active in suffrage uh, organizations. Um, I'll just tell you maybe about one more of these uh, progressive uh, activists. And this is once again still under the rubric of this kind of belligerent, uh, uh, if defensive, uh, social class uh, notion. But in this case, opening onto the uh, new people uh, pouring into the cities of the United States. And this is a guy by the name of John Fitzpatrick. Uh, in this case, he's actually a little bit unusual in the sense that he was um, an immigrant from Ireland. Uh, most of these um, Irish American labor leaders that I'm talking about uh, were actually the children of immigrants. And that sounds like a detail, but actually it's important because the point about them is that they're not steeped in tra traditional Irish culture at all. They're very much sort of urban uh, people. He came um, as an immigrant, but he was actually quite young. Uh, and he went to work in the stockyards uh, as a teenager. And he remained. Uh, in the stockyards neighborhood uh, all of his life, even as he rose to become president of the Chicago Federation of Labor. His wife is sort of classic, uh, um, uh, an Irish teacher, Irish Catholic teacher, very uh, devout religiously. Uh, Fitzpatrick um, broke a lot of the sort of stereotypes that you might have about the working class Irish. He was a very staunch uh, teetotaler, uh, which made, it was a big problem uh, because a lot of the uh, uh, union uh, meetings in cities like New York and Chicago and other places were actually held in saloons, uh, but he would not uh, enter the saloon. If you wanted him to come to a meeting, you had to have it outside the saloon. What's important about Fitzpatrick for our purposes is that he opened the labor movement to the new uh, migrant peoples uh, and um, 
this, not too surprisingly, I think a lot of us would say, uh, resulted in a, a sort of resounding success in the short, in the, the short run. Uh, both in the meatpacking industry in Chicago, in the steel industry, and other places in the country, the new immigrants came pouring in. And uh, Fitzpatrick also uh, developed an excellent reputation for working with uh, black workers. Um, it's hard to tell in retrospect how much of this was idealism. He was, certainly was a very idealistic guy, very staunch Irish nationalist, incidentally. Uh, and how much of it was practical. Beyond a certain point in cities like Chicago or in steel mill towns, uh, they're, they're, you're either going to have a racially integrated labor movement or you're not going to have a labor movement. And so in some sense, it might have been uh, uh, practical sort of uh, considerations for trade union organization that move him in this direction. The Irish uh, Manhattan's west side, where Irish do dockers had first driven blacks off the pier, piers in the mid-19th century, and then fought a series of ferocious battles against Italians and other outsiders. Radical nationalism expanded the Irish-American perspective, raising the promise, if briefly, of a link to these and other groups and to a broader transnational notion of what we mean by labor. In August 1920, Irish longshoremen launched what some people consider an early political strike in the history of the United States demanding the release of Sinn Féin leader and Cork Lord Mayor Terence McSwiney from a uh, London prison. Italian longshoremen and British coal handlers joined the strike. Uh, newly enfranchised Irish American women spread the strike with the help of other immigrant women to Brooklyn, Hoboken, Boston, and other ports. When employers brought in black strike breakers, the women issued signs proclaiming the emancipation the Irish, <coughs> excuse me, is the emancipation of all mankind. And, quote, Ireland for the Irish, Africa for the Africans. Black workers walked off the ship and fell in line with what had become a remarkably diverse line of march. A group of Irish workers and nationalist leaders went up to Harlem during the strike to negotiate an arrangement with Marcus Garvey's group, promising to allow blacks to work on Chelsea's, quote, Irish peers. Garvey sent a representative down to the Chelsea docks to appeal to black longshoremen to support the strike. Most Irish dockers reverted to what one calls an older and more familiar pattern of localism following the strike's collapse. But in fact, Pier 60, the most Irish on Manhattan's waterfront, continued to accept some black from that point on. Thus, for a moment, this historian concludes, two parallel nationalisms had converged to create genuine bonds of sympathy and a tangible redistribution of resources among working men who had long regarded each other with suspicion and hatred. I want to give you just a feel for what this, what I'm calling Americanization from the bottom up, looked like. And this is sort of at the local level now. Uh, this is in the slaughterhouses and packing houses in Chicago. Uh, where the Irish represented, uh, this is a little bit after the century, they represented probably about 20% or so of the labor force, and they represented closer to 60% of the, uh, these are shop floor um, officials now. These are people uh, literally elected by the, by the uh, men and women on the floor in their bloody apron. They're the people that are elected to represent them uh, to management. And this example, in general, what happened there and in other places was that the process of unionization uh, in this early period now uh, descended sort of from the level of the more skilled, more experienced Irish and German workers to the level of the unskilled laborers who are mostly black and uh, Eastern European, Poles and Lithuanians and so forth. And this very short quote, uh, uh, David knows this one by heart, other people may not have heard, actually comes from women's local. Uh, this, this uh, sort of Irish-led uh, organizing, uh, uh, thoroughly organized women workers in the stockyards and again was led by uh, mostly Irish-American uh, workers. And this is uh, apropos of what's the Americanization from the bottom up. In other words, if, we, if you humor me for a moment and, and consider this as a process of acculturation, what are the values that are being paced, uh, passed on? And this is at a union meeting, a local meeting, uh, run by an Irish-American, uh, second-generation Irish-American woman. And there's a problem, there's a grievance on the floor. So she says, now what did you just call each other? She called me a nigger. The other one says, she called me a Polak first. <laughs>
Both of you ought to be ashamed of, of yourselves. You're both to blame. But don't you know that this question in our ritual doesn't mean that kind of grievances, but grievances of a whole bu bunch of us. So it's a very short sort of statement and a huge lesson. Uh, what we're talking about is social class, uh, social difference on the basis of race and nationality, and that the first must, uh, in organization and in action, trump the second, otherwise we're not going to have a uh, strong movement. So you could call that a kind of working class uh, multiculturalism by today's standards. I want to just finish up a little bit by talking about Irish women who play a very uh, big role in this book that I'm working on and, and won't be able to today, but I'd like to give you an idea of how they sort of figured into this process. They play particularly important roles as uh, teaching and as nursing nuns, uh, teachers, union organizers, suffrage activists, but they also played a role at a much more intimate level. Between 1899 and 1924, only the Irish of the major ethnic groups coming to the United States had a majority of women, 53.6%. The, the uh, sort of comparable group would be uh, Russian, East European Jews, relatively high proportion of women, but uh, very high among the Irish. Like other nationalities, Irish immigrant women tended to marry within their own ethnic group. But in the large Irish American third generation, second and especially third generation, at about the same time that the new immigration was peaking, out marriage among Irish American women were actually New York's Irish Americans were far more likely to intermarry with recent immigrants than with a far spectrum of other groups than was a far broader spectrum of other groups in the 56 nationalities that were studied. Intermarriage, even in small numbers, um, had high symbolic value. Members, uh, memories of 19th century marriages of Irish uh, women to African American and Chinese men likely enhanced their reputation for outmarriage and also for fears uh, of racial amalgamation. At the everyday level, then, the phenomena um, meant that Irish American mothers brought their own cultures into these interethnic families. And I want to close with uh, the closest. Uh, um, of an explanation uh, for, for this, uh, wh why they seem to be so successful at this. Uh, what I hope I've got to this point is sort of the character of the culture a bit of Irish American culture, this, dis this very defensive uh, uh, sort of culture, and yet one with elements, uh, particularly religion, but also to some extent uh, among the idealist politics of other people. I think that at the heart of Irish influence in the American city was what today we would call social capital. The existence of a network of connections, Bourdieu writes, is not a natural given or even a social given. It is the product of an endless effort. The history of Irish Americans' relations with other ethnic and radical groups is largely the story of their efforts to build and maintain these networks in the face of massive migration of other peoples to American cities. They proved masters at transforming contingent relations, such as those of neighborhood, workplace, or even kinship, into institutions which afforded them economic, social, cultural, and political power. In the process, they shaped a world that later immigrants and migrants confronted, inhabited, and employed in the process of their own acculturation to urban industrial society. The short-term effects of this massive immigration was not to diminish, but rather to enhance Irish influence. The erection of strong parishes, unions, political organizations continued, constituted what might be termed bonding uh, capital. Uh, and this is one of many places where uh, the ideas that I'm drawing are ideas that Dave and I have worked on together. Um, so this is what underlay this strong defensive sort of mentality characterizing many Irish American communities well into the networks could have provided institutions helps to explain why they came into conflict so often with other racial and ethnic groups and how in response Later groups erected their own networks and institutions, often modeled on those of the Irish, to compete for power and resources. 
What makes the Irish experience crucial, though, I think, uh, uh, is what might be termed bridging social capital. The Irish often integrated newcomers through their own religious institutions and political and labor organizations, if only because uh, as people uh, poured into the city, uh, it was necessary to do so in order to maintain uh, the, these institutions the Irish had created and to maintain some level uh, of influence. The of all strategies were etched in millions of individual contacts between Irish Americans and other peoples. It's difficult to conjure up any net effect, but it's clear that in building and employing uh, both this bridging and bonding capital, uh, Irish Americans played a vital, ro vital role in the creation of multi Thank you. U.S. city, the answer that Jim gives is five million. And I think that that's really the key to the strength of his work over a 25-year period now, including and before the seminal essay, Americanization from the Bottom Up, which was really the key to uh, all of our work together and the breakthrough for a lot of uh, immigration history that uh, let us uh, show how immigrants make uh, the history of immigration. Thanks. Um, the other joke is uh, an Irishman, a Pole, and an Italian are some three groups always. Um, Jim's presentation gives us some sense of why all of those jokes always include an Irish uh, person. Uh, the centrality of the Irish at every turn and in these networks that fan out uh, are a feature of urban existence in the late 19th and early 20th uh, century. United States. So I want to be very brief and give you a chance to ask questions of Jim. Um, and I, I want to talk, make two points that might be 12 or they might be zero actually at the end of the day, but they kind of coalesce around two uh, issues that Jim's paper, and I read the paper and then uh, the presentation was a little bit different, uh, but two sets of issues that the paper uh, raised. The first is uh, this quality of Irish American culture as what Jim calls most often defensive uh, and then uh, most promisingly I think defensive and aggressive at the same uh, time and Jim talked in his presentation about the kind of two-ness of everything that he that he was uh, saying I think it, it's important to keep that two-ness uh, forward defensive aggression or uh, insular without being isolated in some uh, ways, but also to realize that for many of the groups that were on the receiving end of Irish American culture, it didn't really seem defensive at all uh, necessarily. So in reminiscences of uh, African Americans on street gangs and patrolling of uh, boundary lines of, of neighborhoods, that seemed like aggressive, in those sources, that seems like an aggressive culture born, however much, of defensiveness. The history of policing and how uh, black and new immigrant uh, populations thought that they were being policed by uh, Irish cops is another uh, such issue. And on a, a more storied level, the reaction of Polish and other new immigrant kids to Irish American nuns and sometimes Irish nuns is something that at the point of contact really seemed like aggression. Uh, although uh, we know it was uh, laden with defensiveness um, as well. A recent monumental book by Dennis Lehane, I hesitate to say of all people, uh, The Given Day is set in 1919 and really tries to get at these issues in a textured way and happens to explore over 800 pages the intersections of lives uh, of, in Boston and to a certain extent in Tulsa of uh, Irish, an Irish police family, an Italian anarchist, uh, family and an African-American uh, family. And, and part of what I think Lahane's 
uh, the given day uh, represents is uh, the centrality of gender to any kind of way that we would want to conceptualize the ways that Irish American culture was defensive and aggressive, and also the ways that um, aggression and defensiveness reached into Irish American families themselves, not only characterized their relations with, uh, with other uh, groups. And I think that uh, the kind of gendered relations and the extent of intermarriage that Jim concludes the, the paper with are very promising in this regard for, among other things, um, showing us the distinctiveness of the Irish American experience. The uh, Irish were practically alone in having relatively equal gender ra uh, ratios even in the first uh, generation. So the idea of an Irish family, uh, a functioning Irish family, is established from the outset in the way that it's not uh, for, for other groups. But also I think that the, the uh, emphasis on intermarriage reminds us of this twoness because the literature on Irish slash somebody else intermarriage, which was tremendous even in popular culture, there was an obsession with uh, Irish-Jewish intermarriage in, in popular culture in the, in the uh, 1920s. But it was expected that that wasn't just an index of um, cosmopolitanism on the Irish part, but it was a battleground. The intermarried family was a battleground in which cultures uh, met. And again and again, I think we see this uh, in Kansas City in the 1920s, for example. Uh, in the factories there, Irish American foremen were often accused by Eastern European uh, Catholic workers of refusing to call them by their names and calling them all hunky when they needed something uh, instead. But at the same time, those jobs were open to those Eastern European workers through the agency of Irish American bosses working through church groups dominated by Irish Americans and to a fairly uh, considerable extent, uh, by the end of the 1920s, uh, families were intermarried across the Irish uh, new immigrant line uh, in Kansas City. So that's the first set of points. The second set of points is really my own riddle. And that is um, hearing this and reading this and, and thinking about what I've been thinking about lately. The riddle is why Irish solidarity dramatic transnationally? And why is it for us to imagine black Irish solidarity transnationally and hard to forge and even hard to imagine on the ground? And Lahane's novel really runs right into this. He just has no way of really plausibly imagining how black Irish solidarity is going to emerge in Boston in 1919. He kind of makes it happen, but it's very, very fictional. About um, the commitment novel, in a different way, the crying game, if we think about uh, St. Clair uh, Bourne's fabulous documentary, the late now St. Clair Bourne's fabulous documentary, The, the Green and the Black, about Irish uh, African-American connections around nationalism and uh, black power. But it's actually very easy artistically to imagine. It becomes possible to think about that not from common oppression on the ground. I don't have this. I think um, that it's dangerous too hard on the job competition world. through most of the 19th century there were so few African Americans in northern cities that other groups were always the main, in fact other counties in Ireland were always the main competitors in the way that Irish people thought about the world uh, for jobs. But um, there's a fabulous YouTube video that somebody sent me uh, with uh, the former Black Panther, who now calls himself an anarchist, walking around kind of aimlessly in Dublin at the anarchist fair, and he's saying, people treat me so well here, and I'm so happy here, and I always dreamed about coming here when I was in prison. And uh, then he says, quote, but we haven't necessarily gotten on that well in the U.S. <laughs> and so this, there's this question that I think emerges, and to, to conclude, I think maybe to go back and address that question, um, we need to, to think about the longer past of this. 
I'm thinking about Donello Kelly's 2005. Uh, tour of Ireland uh, in exile. Uh, so O'Kelly wants to uh, uh, Douglas not only as a, a person, and he wants to retell all of Irish history in Ireland, and particularly to make points about contemporary Irish immigration around the experience of Douglas's visit. And it's a it's a kind of a a reminder, as is uh, Nene Rogers' uh, new book on uh, slavery and anti-slavery in Ireland over a three-century uh, period, that we also had the same pattern in the uh, 1830s and 1840s of passionate Irish solidarity with slaves in Ireland, and then real troubles when you get to direct face-to-face -face contact um, in the United States. And I think to take that lo the measure of that longer history uh, brings us to the role of colonial common experience of colonialism in mediating uh, Irish unity, but also reminds us uh, that uh, Ireland itself and the Irish have a very complicated history uh, as both the victims and the functionaries of the British Empire. So I'll.